Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining today's webinar, How to Navigate Your Seeds of Hope Grant Application, a step-by-step -step guide. As we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I come to you from Toronto, which is a traditional lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, one of the things that I am doing with my two young children is uh, I'm learning and teaching them about the history and the intention of these treaties so we can learn and grow together. So again, thank you for joining today's webinar. I am Eric Lofort. I am the lead uh, at the United Church of Canada Foundation, um, where one of my primary tasks is managing our granting programs, including uh, Seeds of Hope. Um, I have over 15 years of experience in both the management side of grants and the searching and applying side of grants as well. Um, before I share my screen and dive into what we're all here for to see the step-by-step -step process of the application. I do just kind of want to start off by saying, um, talking a little bit about what Seeds of Hope is, just so everyone's coming from the same spot. So Seeds of Hope is the United Church, one of the United Church of Canada Foundation's granting programs. This granting program is really focused on supplying grants to United Church organizations and partners um, for new and innovative programming that they are undertaking. The granting program has two rounds annually, one in the spring, which we are currently in, and one in the fall. The spring round opens in early January, and the deadline for applications is April 15th, and the fall round will open up in July, and applications uh, will be due October 15th. Common question I get is, which uh, cycle should I apply for, the spring or the fall? And it's completely dependent on when uh, you are wanting to know about funds available to you and if they will be. So typically, if you're going to have a project in the early fall or winter, uh, I think the spring is the appropriate time to apply. And similarly, if you're going to have something early in the new year to uh, the spring, I would suggest the fall is the best time to apply. With that being said, I'm going to share my screen now and we will go through the application. So what I am showing you um, is what you will see as uh, the applicant. This is not a back-end piece. This is exactly what you will see. Well, firstly, I'll say that our application is digital. Um, you can save and come and go as you please, answer questions in any order that you want. Um, but of course, if you do need a hard copy, um, a paper version of the application, please reach out and we're happy to provide that as well. Um, first, I'd bring your attention to the right uh, margin. Uh, this is a margin that goes through each part of the application, and you can see each question as you scroll through. Um, again, you can kind of click and choose which question you'll want to go through if you don't want to go in order. But the primary part that you'll be looking at and using is the question in the center of, this, of the uh, screen. You'll see, firstly, what part of the application you are in. There are five parts of the application. Uh, secondly, you'll see what the question itself is. So in this case, name of organization, and some questions underneath that, it'll have some subtext expanding on the question or providing some additional uh, information that'll help you answer the question. The next piece is the spot where you'll be answering your question. This can be in the form of uh, written paragraphs, um, sentences, sometimes they are number slots, but they'll usually give you a prompt here like this one saying, uh, enter an, uh, an answer. And then some questions you'll also see a word count. So that is just kind of the general overview of it. So now I'll go through question by question. So part one, uh, the part one of the application is the organization details. And this, these are the kind of the basic who are you questions. Uh, they allow us to uh, put in some basic information. Um, so one, name of organization, they'll give us uh, your answer would be, who is the organization applying? Uh, try to put in here the actual name of the organization and not um, a board or the committee that is overseeing the project itself. It would be who is receiving the grant, who is looking for the money. The next question is uh, the contact name. Who is the contact uh, that we should be speaking to if there are any questions? So this could be you as the applicant, uh, or this could be um, uh, someone else on your committee who is overviewing it. Um, please provide their first and last name. The next question is the title of that contact. Give us a little bit more context of who that would be. Is that the minister of the organization? Is that maybe just um, 
a member of the community. And this is a click box. The next is what is the organization's mailing address? So again, if you listed Trinity United Church as the uh, applying uh, of the applicant, what is Trinity's mailing address? Please ref try your best not to put in uh, your treasurer's address or your board chair's address. Um, we prefer to know the address of the organization applying itself. The city of the organization. The next question is the province of the organization. And its postal code. So again, really basic. Who are you? Where are you located? The next is the phone number. This phone number is for whom we'd want to contact, again, if we had any questions about the project or about the application. Similarly, an email. How can we contact that primary contact or the organization by email? Website. It's not required, but if you have a website, we'd love to see it. So it can, again, if we have any questions or want to read more about your ministry or your work, we have that right there at our fingertips. Have you ever received granting monies from the United Church or the United Church of Canada Foundation before? Uh, this question is just asking strictly that. Have you received money before? Yes or no. Um, I'm going to stay by answer the question as truthfully as you know. Um, there is no benefit or uh, con for saying yes or no to that. Some people sometimes feel this is a weighted question of, oh, if I've received money before, I might not qualify again, or no, if I haven't received money, then I don't qualify. No, it's simply just to give us a sense of uh, where our relationship is or has been and where uh, the relationship with the Greater United Church has been. If you click yes and then click next, you will get a sister table. If you click no, you will not see this, but if you click yes, you'll get a sister table, which is just the drop down of saying, how much have you been awarded before? in what year and what the source was. So you could say, uh, I was awarded $1,000 in 2023 from the Foundation Seeds of Hope. Or you could say, I was awarded $10,000 in 2022 as a United Church Mission and Service Grant. It's completely up to you. Again, fill this out to the best of your ability. It just gives us a sense of where our relationship is. The next question, how did you hear about Seeds of Hope? It's really beneficial for us to know where you heard about it so we know where to put our efforts in promotion. Part of our goal is to promote this as much as possible, create the access to funding as much as possible. And so if we can get a sense of where people are coming from, it better helps us do that. And so you can click all that supply, uh, apply. Did you contact the foundation staff to talk about the proposal? Again, this is similar to uh, the have you received money before. You don't need to read more into it than it actually is. It's just simply for us to know, was there a contact made before? Sometimes people want that contact or need that contact to talk about, about their application or about a project. And sometimes they don't need to. Maybe it's they filled out applications several times, or maybe they're really confident and don't need it. Again, there's no need to read into this question more than I find some people do. Um, the next question is regional council, your organization, which re regional council are you a part of? Which region do you fall into? And this is a drop down menu, so you can pick and choose. So that is part one. All those questions were pretty basic. It just gives us a general sense of who are you, where are you located, where has our relationship been in the past? The next questions are part two, are the project overview. And this is really where um, you are going to be selling the project itself. What am I doing? What are my goals? What are my objectives? Most of these questions are going to be um, in the form of written answers, and it's a time to express and show your passion and the importance of the work that you're proposing. So the first question is, which funding cycle are you applying for? As mentioned at the top of it, we have two, spring and fall. Uh, if you are applying this round, you'll be, of course, clicking the spring. If you're applying in the next one, you'll be clicking in the fall. Um, we ask if that you not submit a fall application during the spring round and vice versa. Um, if we do see that you've submitted an application to click that fall, frankly, we're probably going to reach out and say, did you intend to apply this round or next round? The next question is, what granting funds are you applying to? So um, this is about uh, how Seeds of Hope is formed. So some granting programs, there is just a budget line. For example, it's the organization is given $1 million and it's just give it away in this granting program. The way the Seeds of Hope is works is that 
the granting funds are made by several different trusts and endowments that the United Church of Canada holds. Each one of those trusts and endowments has specific criteria of what it can grant to. And that is what the list of funds that you see. So anti-poverty, camping, children and youth, environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in this question, we're really saying, where do you see your project fitting within these uh, different funds that we're offering with a maximum of three? So if you have more than three, great, but choose your top three. Um, if you do choose the three, it doesn't mean that you are uh, shoehorned to only receive funding out of those funds. It just gives us a sense of where do you see your project falling within our whole granting program itself? All right. Um, if you do what, whichever one or up to three that you choose, uh, and when you click next, it will give you a sister question, just asking you for a hundred words on how does your project actually address that fund? So if you say our project addresses anti-poverty, how does it do that? It says our project addresses the environmental concerns. How is it doing that? So again, you will only see these questions depending on which question you answer prior to that. The next one, project title, seems simple enough, but sometimes people get tripped on it. What do you call your project? I usually suggest do something that might be obvious for people because it is something that we will use in any publications. So if you were chosen uh, to be awarded a grant, we would say, Trinity United Church was awarded a grant for their Peace Garden project. So make sure you choose something appropriate and that works for you because also you probably want to promote the project itself and you want to have a title that people can relate to and understand quickly. Is this a new project? Um, preference for are, is given to new projects in Seeds of Hope. And I say new is what's new to you, not, not what's new to us. And so what is new to you might not be new for to the next person, but that is fine. It's what is new to you. So what I would consider a new project is maybe some a project that has not yet started, uh, a project that has started recently, or a project that maybe you've ran a pilot or a couple pilots of it, and now you're ready to launch it in its full capacity. That would be new. What we would I would not consider new is something that maybe a program you've been running for several years now. Uh, it hasn't gone through a new iteration. And really what you're looking for is just an insertion of funding to this old program. That I would not consider new. That being said, it does not disqualify you from applying for Seeds of Hope. It's just, it's important to note that preference is given to new projects as that is what the basis of the, of the program is for. Is your project being carried out in Canada? This is a yes or no question. It's important to note that Seeds of Hope only grants to projects that are being carried out in Canada. So things that we would uh, not accept is, one, are you uh, not a Canadian organization? Uh, that would be uh, would not meet our criteria. Two would be if your project was saying, hey, my local church, we have a partner in India that we support annually, and we want some granting money to send to them so they can do their work. Sounds great. I'm really happy that your organization has that partnership, but that's not what Seeds of Hope grants to. And similarly, Seeds of Hope doesn't grant to what would be considered uh, mission work. So if you said, hey, we want to send a bunch of our youth to the Philippines to do something, we need airfare uh, help, that is something that Seeds of Hope does not grant to. Target, in, target project implementation date. When is a project starting? This can be current, in the future, in the past, but when did the project that you were proposing start? Or when is it going to start? Completion date, when do you see the project being completed? Some projects that we receive will have firm completion dates. So um, I'm going to use a probably a lot through this, I'll be using a garden project as an example, but a garden project might have a firm start and a firm completion date. Other projects might not have a firm completion date and that is okay. I would suggest filling out a completion date here along the lines of when you think any Seeds of Hope funding would be exhausted by. So maybe you say, hey, we've applied for $10,000. We think that will be expended throughout the year. So we'll put the completion date uh, for the end of the year, but we'll know from the rest of the application that this is uh, an ongoing or wants to be an ongoing project. Um, it's important to note that um, after grants, we, we ask for reports on how the project went. We base that report on the target completion date that you will be submitting to us. 
So usually it's one month after that completion date, we ask for a report to be submitted. Next, project team members. Uh, so this is who's on the team. I, I see, I will know previously in your questions, who's, who's applied, what organization, but who makes up the team? Who's supporting the project? Uh, you can be specific with giving us specific names that um, Susan Smith is, uh, is on our team and they're doing this. And Mark Elliott is on the team and they're doing this. Or you could be more generic. You can say things like, our board will be responsible for doing this role. Our trustees will be responsible for doing this role. It's really up to you based on what your project structure looks like. But it's just nice to see, okay, who else other than the applicant itself is part of this project? Who is overlooking this project? Who is going to make sure it's getting done? The next, describe how your project fits into your organization's identity and ministry. So this is an opportunity for you as an applicant or whomever is the applicant to really say the importance of this project and your organization's ministry. Why is this project uh, imperative to continuing the ministry and the work that you do? Or does it not do that? So for example, to my gardening project, um, I might write something in here. Uh, if my gardening project has a uh, reconciliation theme to it, um, maybe that is part of it. I'm saying like, as our community of faith is focusing on reconciliation efforts, this peace garden is an important piece to that ministry continuing and offering something to our community. So this again is really sell us how your project is so integral to the ministry of the organization that you were doing and the identity that you were creating in your community. Project description. This is as simple as it sounds. It's your elevator pitch. What are you doing? Any reviewer should be able to read your project description and hopefully your title and know exactly what you are doing. We've kept the word count at 75 words uh, because it should be short. Um, that being said, it should still show passion and um, express the need of it, but really say leave out history and leave out goals and objectives. Simply write, this is what we're doing and why almost. So um, for example, for my Peace Garden, you can say something here of in, 20, in the summer of 2024, our community of faith is uh, undergoing a Peace Garden uh, construction program, uh, which will help focus our community of faith in our reconciliation initiatives and also giving uh, needed green space to the at-risk families that don't have that in our urban center. That can be the description. Um, I would leave out something like when our building was constructed in 1971, it was all grassed over and we haven't taken over the grass and now we want to build a project. That's nice history, but it's not a description of what you were doing with the project. Try to keep it with what is a project doing uh, and leave it as simple as that. Um, that being said, I will say, put in your passion again, simply just don't write in, we're building a, a garden project. It's wow us with something. But again, most importantly, I should be able to read this or any reviewer should be able to read your description and know exactly what your proposal is and what your project is. Next, project uniqueness. What makes this project unique? Is it different than what things you've done in the past? Is it different from what other groups in your area have done in the past? What makes it unique? What makes it innovative? And again, like the new term, this is what makes it unique and different to you. Um, understanding that everybody has a different sense of that. So keep that in mind. Project goals and objectives. So the next series of questions, 26, 27, 28, and 29, they all relate to the goals and objectives of each one. So they're all, while they're set four separate questions, they all relate and you can, you'll be asked to expand upon each question. So the first one is goals and objectives. Simply list, what are the goals and objectives of the project that you're undertaking? Uh, they can be short-term goals, they can be long-term goals, but they should be in this section concrete and well-defined so we have a sense of, okay, this is what they're trying to do with the project. So the project description is that you're doing a peace garden. Your goals and objectives might be engage the community in the use of it. It might be ensure uh, native plant life is included in it. Uh, make sure there's pollination plants in there. What are your goals and objectives? Um, 
small and big. Where the next question is, what is your plan for stating the goals and objectives? So the question before you said, these are my goals and objectives. And this next question is, what is the plan for achieving that? So uh, for example, you might say, uh, we've, we've partnered up with an indigenous, uh, local indigenous group who knows the native plant life here, who is helping us supply those. Or it might be, um, we're attending community events to engage that community, uh, inviting them to use the garden once it's constructed. What is your plan for achieving those goals? And it's nice as reviewers to see a mirror almost. So if you say, here are my four goals to address them again, one, two, three, four in the next question. The next question is, how are you going to assess whether or not you've achieved your goals? Simple. You've said your goals, you've uh, said what your plan is, and now it's how are you going to assess whether they've been successful or not? And we don't expect that every goal and objective is going to be successful. We value knowing that things work and things don't, and we can learn in both ways. So um, don't only hold yourself to goals and objectives that you think are attainable in some cases. Sometimes it's nice to have those blue sky objectives that you want to hit. And so we understand that they might not be hit and that's okay. But in this question, how do you assess that? And then the next one is your time time frame for achieving those goals. So again, depending on what your goals can be, the time frame could be a very like short, like week one of June, um, this is the outcome that we're looking at happening. Or it could be Q1 2025, this is what we see is happening. Whatever time frame works for your project, we're happy to kind of meet you at that point. But give us almost a sense of how long-term and short-term these goals and objectives you have for the project are. It provides a good context of scope of, again, is this an ongoing project or is this a short-term thing? What is it really they're trying to accomplish? Uh, what is the lasting uh, impact of a project like this? And that really helps when you kind of organize goals and objectives in this way. And it's certainly by providing a timeline. Next question is project beneficiaries. So this is who's benefiting from the project. Uh, is this your community of faith only? Is this the wider community? Is this the bigger church as a whole? Um, is this a specific subsect of your community? Um, I like to think when when I think of projects and programs, I like to think of all scales. So it's nice to say, this is directly who is impacted in my community. This is the beneficiaries in my regional area geographically. And then nationwide, this is what I think the impact can be. Um, so that's an easy way of me of wrapping my head around tackling a question like this is breaking it down into different areas. But of course, you have to do what makes sense for your project. The next question is, what steps have you taken to work with and communicate with those beneficiaries? So if you've listed that um, our Peace Garden is going to positively impact the at-risk community around me, what steps have you taken to engage them? Have they asked for this? Have they not asked for this? I think this is an undervalued part of any project, uh, is talking to who you believe the beneficiaries to be, because rather than us creating a program saying, oh, you know who's really gonna love it is this group. And then when you, after you spend all the money and all the time and going through this project, you talk to that group and they're like, oh, that's great, but what we really needed was X, or uh, we don't really feel comfortable with that, what you've done. So how have you engaged in them? Uh, and what steps have you taken? The next is, does your project address any of the United Church of Canada's four priorities? So similarly to the, what funds do you see your project falling into? This is, what priorities do you see them falling into? So in 2022, the foundation named four uh, main pillars and priorities. That is anti-racism work, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, climate justice, and supporting of communities of faith. So does the project that you are proposing address any of those pillars? Similarly to the other one, when you click on one of them and choose next, it will ask you to expl explain how your project is actually addressing that project, that uh, priority piece. And you break that there. Examples of demonstrated support. So this is just a simple list of who your partners are or what the community involvement is. Further down, I believe at the end of part four, there is a section where you can attach things like letters of support or supporting documentation. Maybe you list them here. 
Um, again, it, like the team piece, it gives us a sense of, okay, outside of the team, outside of the applicant, who is really supporting this, who's on board with this. And then last is for part two is, how would you recognize any support from the United Church of Canada Foundation? So if you were awarded a grant, uh, how would you announce that? Uh, this question is not about a vanity piece from the foundation. This is really about um, the granting funds that are awarded through Seeds of Hope are United Church donors who have entrusted us with these funds to grant out in support of you. So it's really great for them to see the recognition of their support. And, and in turn, it, showing support inspires other groups to see what's available and try something new themselves. And so this question is simply saying, how would you do that? How would you, how would you show that support, recognize that support um, to inspire others and the donors that have generously given to make the project a success? So that is part two. So again, part one, that nitty gritty, who are you? Part two is the, what is your project trying to do? Uh, how are you doing it? And now part three is the financial aspect of it. How are you going to pay for the project itself? So question one for Seeds of, from Seeds of Hope. How much are you asking from the United Church of Canada Foundation? Please note that Seeds of Hope can only grant up to 50% of your total cost. So if you say, hey, my garden project's going to cost $50,000, the maximum you could ask from Seeds of Hope is $25,000. Uh, I ask in this question that you do write a number. Um, Refrain from typing something in here like whatever you can afford or whatever you want to give. While that's a nice sentiment, that's not doing your project any favors. What do you need to get it off the ground? That is really what the question is saying. The next table uh, and the following pieces, similarly to the goals and objectives, the next pieces are all intertwined with each other. So the first one is the project revenues. This table is really saying, how much is your project going to cost and where is that money coming from? So we have project revenues, the amount, if that money is confirmed and when that money can be uh, confirmed. So project revenues, we've listed what we think are good catch-alls for you. So what money is being contributed from the organization? What is being contributed from other United Church of Canada support? Are there any other grants that you've applied for? Is there fundraising that you're doing? Uh, is there funding from partners? And then you would write in the last column how much, again, you want from Seeds of Hope. Please ensure that this number matches the number from the previous question, uh, because it's important when you're kind of doing it. If you're saying I'm asking for 25000 in question uh, 35, and then in question 36, you're saying I actually need $10,000, what, what do you want? So I'll give you an example of how to fill this out. Organizational funds. You might say, hey, you know what? My community of faith is giving us $1,000. So you'll put 1000 here. Yep, they've already given it to us. So you click yes, and then you'll enter when you got that. If you say, you know what, we don't have any other United Church of Canada support, you leave that all blank. Uh, other grants, you can say, yeah, we actually have $30,000 of other grants out there. You type in the 30,000 and you say, you know what? No, we haven't heard about it. So you'd click no, and then you can click in when you think you might hear about those grant dates. So, and then you would do that for each column. If you don't have it, you just leave it blank. If it's there, you add it. Note that any number you put into the amount column will auto sum at the bottom of the page. And so this number in the total revenues is what we use to say, this is what they, to their best estimate, think the project will cost. All right. The next piece is revenue sources. So the question before, you told us kind of financially, we have $1,000 here, we are getting $2,000 from there, $20,000 from there, and now we're asking for you to tell us who they are. So in the first one, I think in the example in the chart, we said uh, the community of faith was giving $10,000. So here you'd say, this is coming from Trinity United Church, our operating budget. Or you can say it's coming from uh, a generous endowment that the our community of faith had uh, specifically for this project. But what is it? So this isn't asking for how much, this is asking for who. Similarly to if you said, we said in the other grants, we said in the previous table, yep, we have some other grant feelers out there. No, we don't have the money yet, but this is who they're from. So you might write in here, 
we have a $5,000 request from Trillium Foundation, and we might have uh, a $5,000 request from the Toronto Community Foundation. Just who else do you have grant feelers out with? Same with other fundraising and funding for partners. So again, this table is asking to expand on the last table. So the last table was saying, what are the dollar figures? This is asking for more specific details of who those dollar figures are coming from. Now it's the project expense section. So in the last two tables, you're saying this is what it's going to cost. And now these expenses are saying this is how we're spending the money. So we've given you four uh, areas of interest, project staff, project materials, publicity, and other. So in this, you would write down what you think in your best estimate is going to cost to staff the project. What do you think is going to cost to actually uh, and materials and supplies? Are we doing advertising? What is it going to cost? Other is everything else. It's important to note that this expense line should be very close to what the total of the project revenue line was. So if in question 36 and 37, you said the project was going to cost $50,000, your expenses should add up to pretty close to $50,000. Okay. If you're not spending money on publicity, let's say, then you just leave it blank. Okay. Uh, we're not telling you how to spend your money. We just want a sense of where that money is going to be spent. And then this table expands on the last one uh, in the sense that uh, this is your major expenses. So if in the previous table you said, hey, we're spending $30,000 on project staff, you should tell us what that is. So is that in hiring of a firm to help you build uh, the project? Or is that um, specifically hiring a specific staff member to lead something? What is that? This is just your major project expenses. So I don't need an itemized list of every shovel and bag of dirt that you spent money on to build a garden. Just what were the most costliest items and how much would that approximately cost? Again, with the revenues and financial areas, um, it's your best estimate at the time of submission. And we completely understand that things fluctuate as time go on, especially in new and innovative projects, things happen. And so it's really, best on your best estimate at the time and with your experience with setting up the project itself. Focused for applied funding. This section is saying how, if you were awarded funding, how would you use the foundation money? So uh, in my example, if you saying we're asking for $25,000 from Seeds of Hope, where would that $25,000 go? So you could say we're using it on staff or we're using our publicity or we're using it on both. But it just gives us a sense of how are you spending the money that uh, has been awarded from the foundation. Proposed plan revisions if funding is unavailable. So this is tell us what happens if you don't get this grant. Uh, what happens to your project if for whatever reason you were unsuccess unsuccessful with your application. Here, I really stress to not write the project won't happen without your funding. Um, I know it's maybe potentially true. Uh, sometimes I feel that people write that because it shows urgency. If you say the project won't happen without your help, it feels we're saying we must help it no matter what. But in turn, it can also be seen as this project isn't important enough for you to think of secondary uh, funding or what happens next. Um, or um, that uh, you really haven't thought about the sustainability of the project and what happens. And so here I really stress, rather than saying um, the project won't happen, maybe it's something like we'll have to scale back on certain elements of the project, or we'll have to push our timelines from this summer to next summer, um, whatever that may be. But I really think it's important to say what that might be. And it's almost a disservice to say it won't happen uh, without any help, um, because I think Push comes to shove, if you think about it, it still can happen just differently than originally thought. And then this next part is, um, and again, any supporting documentation that you might have. This could be uh, letters of support from community members. This could be uh, partnership agreements. This could be drawings. 
Uh, it could be a video. Maybe you ran a pilot and you have a video on how that went and you're asking for funding to launch into the next stage. Really, it's up to you. It's up to five things. I think if you're going to do letters of support, try to get those letters of support to show the full breadth of your project, not just five letters from members of your community of faith saying how great the project is. Try to get some from maybe in your members and some from your exterior uh, outside community, some from your partnership, if that's the way you're going. Really use these to the best of your ability to paint a broader picture of it. These are, of course, optional. They are not needed in any submission. All right. Now we're closing to the end of the application. This is part four. So part four is um, the approval section of it. So uh, this is saying, yep, I understand what was written above and we agree to it. And this would be who agrees to it. So who is the applica application been approved by? You can click who it goes to. Who is the signing officer of the application? So this should be if someone of leadership position of your organization or the project saying, yes, I understand that everything written above is accurate to the best of our ability and that if anything happens, I am the signing officer and sign off on everything and can be contacted if something happens. So um, that would be this person. Next, what is the title of that individual? What date was this approved? Was the application approved on? So um, this is simply, yep, the signing authority or the signing group says, yeah, we reviewed this application on this date. The name of the organization, because sometimes the organization who's approving the document might be different than uh, the applying organization. So sometimes, for example, this could be um, a non-registered charity is applying and they're getting their region to sign off on the authority. So that would be here. But if it is the same organization, that is okay to repeat the question as well, saying for both the applicant and the signing authority. What is that charitable registration number of the uh, signing authority? Uh, if you don't have one, uh, let us know. And if you can't find it, we're also help, happy to help you find that. Again, mailing address for the signing authority, city, province, postal code. Uh, and then this last part is about electronic payments. Uh, as much as possible, we are trying to send out all our grants electronically. It allows us to a print less uh, for the environmental impact. It also allows us not to wait on Canada Post and have anything lost in the mail potentially. Um, so for this, it's uh, a simple yes, we've been set up. No, we still like to prefer to have checks. Uh, no, we're not set up, but we would like to set up or unsure. If it's any of the bottom two, uh, it will prompt you with the next question to either fill out a form or contact us accordingly. And then part five, which is the last part, this is the declaration of intent. And this is essentially just the agreement saying, everything is correct. We agree to use the funds as stated. Uh, we agree to provide a report to you. Um, if we can't use the funds as stated, we will contact you and go with next steps, et cetera, et cetera. Once you click yes and agree, and next, you will type the, uh, the name of the person the date of agreeing and then finally it's to your submit screen and you can submit alternatively you can submit it down in the bottom right hand corner when you wish uh, and of course you can as mentioned at the top you can save and quit as you go along so that's the application before i jump into the q a's i do want to leave uh you with a few just kind of tips that you can either use for the seeds of hope applications or for any general uh applications that you might be doing one is i want really want to stress the importance of proofreading. That is both you as a grant writer proofreading what you've written, but also where possible getting an outside source to proofread your application itself. I find a lot of the time as an applicant, you might be really tied very closely with the project that you were submitting an application for and either omit information in unintentionally or use abbreviations that people don't know. And so when you get a third party to review it, they're the ones who will catch things like saying, hey, you keep using this abbreviation, but you actually never say what that is. Or, oh, you mention uh, this piece over here, but you never actually talk about it ever again. So can you expand on that? So proofread, 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 and where possible, get someone who is uh, unfamiliar with the project uh, as closely as you might be to proofread it as well. The next one is answer the questions that are being asked. 
it's really easy, especially in written parts of the question to start writing and then you figure out, oh, I didn't actually answer the question. So if it's saying, what are your goals and objectives? Write what your goals are and objectives are. You don't need to also add in timelines and how you're going to assess it. Simply write, this is my goal, this is my objective. Similar to your project description. Write what you're doing. You don't need to add in history of the land or anything like that. There might be other questions that ask that later. So always answer the questions being asked. And when you're proofreading, I usually think, after I read it, did I answer that question? Or is it giving too much information that isn't directly uh, answering that? The next piece is assume all the questions in an application are being asked uh, for a reason. Sometimes questions might look similar or repeating, but when you look at it, they aren't. And so try not to either leave the question blank or simply write C above question or C previous question for answer, because you have to assume that question is being asked for a reason. Oftentimes when I see the uh, people saying uh, C above question, it's because they didn't answer the question that was being asked in the previous question. So for the goals and objectives, they wrote, here's my goal, here's my objective, here's my timeline. And then when they got to the timeline question, they're like, oh, well, I already answered that. Well, the previous question didn't ask you to put the timeline there. So now put the timeline in the next question. So assume all questions uh, being asked are being asked for a reason and try as much as possible never to leave something blank or say see above. The next one is show your passion and the importance of the project and what you are submitting. People aren't writing applications if they aren't passionate about it. They aren't going through the time of launching a program if they aren't passionate about it. So show that passion. You want any reviewing body to also feel that passion so that they want to support this with a, uh, with a grant. So that is in the language and how you are promoting it. So share that as much as possible. Really inspire uh, the group uh, into wanting to support that. And then lastly, before Q&A, uh, do what you're doing today. Ask, take the time to educate yourself. Oftentimes staff like myself that run programs, we welcome and really want to talk to people, uh, run your ideas past them, um, ask them if you're answering something correctly, ask maybe they can help in reviewing your application before submission, but contact them, reach out and ask, and then in turn, listen to what they're saying to you. Sometimes we have conversations and it feels that they weren't actually looking for an answer. They just wanted to talk about something. But so listen to the feedback that is given because it's often coming from a place uh, where they want to see success. All right, um, questions. Um, I'm going to start going through the questions uh, now. Um, I want to say, uh, if we don't get to all the, your questions and I don't address your question, please feel free to reach out to myself and my team. We're happy to answer anything. Um, so we have one question, which is, what is the average size of grant and, and or is there a dollar limit? Um, I realize the question is contextual. Okay, so um, the average size of the grant, there is no real average size of the grant. You are absolutely right. It is uh, contextual. Um, I think the important part is keeping in mind, again, that 50% mark that Seeds of Hope can't grant beyond that. Uh, and then also, I think the sweet spot for a lot of these is a maximum ask of $25,000. Now, that being said, that there can be there are awards that are more, but that is usually kind of the average maximum, partially because a lot of the work that we are supporting are in an infancy stage. And to say that my project is valued higher than the 25,000 means that your project is gonna cost you more than $50,000 because remember the max of the 50%. Um, so I would say that is uh, the um, sweet spot of the maximum, uh, but there is no real average. Um, I also think, um, Always try to be truthful to what you need in the project, um, because uh, if you start really trying to bend the project into what you think max and mins are, then the financial sections get really messy and they don't quite line up, which makes it really hard to award any funds when you're just like, something doesn't seem right uh, about their finances compared to the rest of the application. So again, be truthful uh, to what your project needs as much as possible. Do we need to identify a seeds, uh, seeds funding source for our project or will we find the best fit? We will find the best fit always. Um, 
Now, one of the questions does ask, which fund are you applying to? Again, that is the anti-poverty, youth, camping, uh, environment, et cetera. Uh, so we'll, we will use those as guidelines. But if we think there's another fit somewhere else, we'll make sure to make it fit in. You are, again, not locked into those choices. Can the application in progress be produced as a PDF? Yes. Uh, so there is a download option. Uh, that you can download the application as a PDF to circulate with others. We realize that right now, there, if you do have multiple people working on an application, uh, you'll have to share the same login and password credentials. Uh, you can't all be working on one application simultaneously. So yes, if you do want to share, you can uh, download it as a PDF. If you can't find that, uh, myself and my team, we can also download it from our end and send it to you as well. What proof is needed in the signing officer has approved the application? Um, the proof is that their names are written there and we have immense trust in our applicants. Um, we don't ask for a signature themselves, but if you if the if the signing authority wants to send us an, an email specifically saying, I understand this application is coming in with my name on it, um, then uh, that's the way it is. There, we do do a audit of some of them and we'll reach out. Uh, throughout, but there is no actual physical signing needed from that signing authority. We have a lot of faith and trust that as a United Church organization applying that you are not try <laughs> trying to pull one over. Um, how does this application get shared with those who approve it? Um, oh, for I'm assuming this is e for the signing authorities. Um, you can download it as a PDF and email it. You can share your login credentials. Um, you can ask us to send them uh, a copy of it. There's several ways uh, of doing that. Great question. Uh, again, another min max, I would say no minimum. Maximum is 25,000 typically, but always feel free to ask for more. And when in doubt, feel free to contact us with your specific ask and we can give you one-on-one uh, -on -one guidance there. Uh, so is a letter of support mandatory? And what kinds of letters are you looking for? Again, letters of support are not mandatory. Uh, they're nice additions. Uh, in the letters of support, I think showing a breadth of your community and beneficiaries is really important. Um, that the letters aren't just repeating themselves. So out of three letters, they all just say, this is great and really needed. Maybe they can all focus on a specific need to them, why they feel it's great. Um, again, any sort of additional uh, information that those can provide are really helpful, but they're they're not mandatory. Similarly to any other um, supporting documentation, whether that's uh, drawings, financial statements, anything. They're just if you think they can add to the story and to what you're trying to uh, do, then add it. But don't just add them for the sake of adding them because you think they needed it. Um, I guess it's important to note that our granting committees uh, review close to 200 applications per round. And so it is a very large task. And so keep that in mind with every additional sentence and piece of information you give, it's another piece uh, that someone has to review. So you should really ensure that does this, is this information compelling? Does it push the story forward? Uh, does it make, uh, does it help in what I'm trying to do? Uh, a question is, are in-kind contributions to be included in the financial information provided? They can be absolutely. Um, I think they can. I think they are best um, included in the financial pieces when they make sense to the project. But I would steer away from it if it's almost artificially bloating your financial information. For example, if someone is saying giving uh, a local caterer is giving you in kind tables and chairs and cups and saucers, whatever, or food, and it's a total of an in-kind gift of $1,000, absolutely, Inc or like 5,000, whatever, include that as a financial contribution. If you're saying our church is letting us use the space, and if we wanted to rent this space, it costs us $30,000 a month, so our project is now a multi-million dollar project over several years, I might not include that uh, because it really bloats out your financial figures and makes it almost... Um, seem like an unattainable project, just like what's happening here. So yes, absolutely uh, keep in kind uh, contributions. They can count as financials, but make sure that it doesn't really skew any numbers to make them look um, 
fraudulent. Um, um, I believe there is a other category in the revenue table, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that was one of the questions. I'll have to look at that again. Again, more in kind, um, labor costs, uh, is labor costs, staff costs, or other? Depends on your project. Uh, I think there's an argument for either. Um, you know your project best, and so do the best to your ability, what you think, um, where you think it fits best. Um, I think depending on what the project is, it can go in either the column for other or the staffing costs. I have a question about um, when can you expect any money if you are awarded some? So uh, for the spring round, uh, applications are due again April 15th. There's about a month and a half of a review process so that's going to uh, granting committees, our board, and applicants are typically awarded the funds uh, either the last weeks of May or the first weeks of June. So for this round, that's when anyone can uh, expect to hear word on whether their application was successful or not, uh, if they're receiving a grant or not, and the value. And in the fall round, it's uh, the first week of December, applicants can expect to hear about um, grants. Yes, so again, uh, the um, question 35 asking how much you're asking for Seeds of Hope, that is 50% of the total cost of the project. Um, Someone asked what the four priorities uh, of, of are for 2024. They're the same as we have identified in 2022. So that is climate justice, uh, reconciliation, communities of faith, and um, anti-racism work. So there's a question, if our goal is part of a larger project, but is a standalone section completed in a very short term, has independent benefits within the larger term project. Uh, what do we describe big or small is what I assume. So this happens often. Sometimes applications that we get are saying, we need support in funding of this very specific piece of a larger picture. If you're approaching it that way, in part two where you're describing your project, it's important to explain, this is the piece that we're working on, but it's a part of a big project. But then when you get to the revenue section and expenses section, you're only doing it for that small piece. So if you are explaining the project description and everything as a small piece of the pie, only put the revenues and expenses and asks for that small piece. If you're going out in the large in scope, then make sure everything aligns with that large uh, scope project. And let me see, I think we have time for, um, one or two more questions. So someone asked about children and youth. What is the age bracket for youth? Uh, completely up to you. Um, I The definitions are pretty loose and people have different um, opinions. Uh, I think youth and can very well be from a young age to early 20s, frankly. I think if you were stretching saying uh, we want a youth program that is targeting 65 plus, we might uh, disagree there. But of course, uh, youth is loose. And also in the second part of life as well, if you're talking about seniors, what do seniors mean to you? What is that age group to, to you? For example, there's a lot of research that say uh, individuals that are at risk or below the poverty line or struggle with disabilities, senior the seniors bracket hits them sooner. And so what is that really happening? So that's completely up to you how you define it. Um, again, I think as long as you can justify it and it makes sense. And then the last question I'll say is, uh, someone asked about question 22, this is the team uh, members one. What happens if you have more members on your project team than numbers of lines given? Just supply us with the lines given, choose the most important ones that you feel will give us a good scope. We fully understand that these project teams can be very large. So again, maybe choose the leadership or maybe 
uh, choose to give us, uh, in my example, rather than individual names, kind of clump people into teams of what they're doing. Um, sorry to everyone else that I couldn't get to your questions. If I didn't answer your questions or after this, you uh, have questions that crop up, please feel free to email, phone uh, myself or anyone on the team, and we're happy to discuss this. Um, as a reminder, applications for this spring round is April 15th, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.